Hello lovely people, welcome to my doe thon wrap up. Sophie Vlogs! I managed to throw in a couple of extras, so enough waffling, let's just go into it. Um, the first book that I finished for Dewey Thon is uh, Boy in a China Shop by Keith Brimer Jones. Keith Brimer Jones is, um, you probably, if you know of him, is because he is the uh, judge on the Great Pottery Throwdown, which is one of my favourite TV shows of all time. I just, I love shows where people make things that are just beautiful and the whole show is like, let's just celebrate everyone who's making wonderful things. Um, and I, I like Keith. He is famous for crying when pots affect him deeply. And as someone who cries when things affect me deeply, I can I can empathise with that. Um, I enjoyed this book. It was uh, interesting to get a, a insight into his life because I did know that he sort of uh, originally found fame as the front man of the Whigs, um, which is sort of like a punk band. And um, that is a really interesting transition to go from being the lead singer in a band into then um, pottery. I have very much come away with an understanding of how driven he is. Like when he was describing like what a typical work day would be like, that kind of thing, like wild, that level of physical commitment as well as mental commitment. Um, there, were, Some of my favourite moments of this were when he really like delved into pot pottery history. That was really interesting. He would give you background on like um, historic information about pottery processes and then also how that tied into his life and that kind of thing and the way that his business grew. Um, that was all really fascinating to learn about and how he got into television as well because as someone who is uh, pot uh, famous for potting, like would you ne you wouldn't necessarily think you'd have a TV career there. Um, I definitely will say that this is a book to read if you are interested in Keith's life. I think, um, and I'm probably going to say this about another biography that I read as well in this, is that um, sometimes biographies are like beautifully written and constructed and it doesn't really matter if you're invested in that person's life or not. This is one that I enjoyed the reading of. I found it a very easy read. I really um, did. I'm glad that I read it. It's not a book that I would say that if... I would say that you would need to either be invested in Keith or have like an active is interest in ceramics to really like get the most out of it. Um, but it was enjoyable. It was a nice way to kick off the month. After that, I finished a tome that is The Paying Guests by Sarah Waters. This is my second Sarah Waters. The first one that I read is Fingersmith, but I have actually consumed others of her through the TV adaptations and the film adaptations that they've had. Um, this is an interesting read. It's like 600 pages. Dewey-thon is a readathon that is based around reading Welsh books. I take part in it every year. I sing its praises. I always have a really great time. Um, and I just thought I'd talk to you about everything that I read. I am pleased with how much I got through, actually. Set in 1922, so we're after the end of World War One, and our main character, I forget everyone's names as soon as I finish a book most of the time, so forgive me for reading the back, but Frances and her mother are obliged to take in lodgers because when Frances's father died, they were left with debts, um, so this couple move in, and one thing that I really enjoyed about this is this sort of look at class in the wake of World War One, because Frances and her mother are a very different class to these lodgers and there is tension there between these two groups because they are used to existing in different ways. Um, there is a tension because of the practicalities of dealing with a level of struggle that Frances and her mother have never had to face before um, and there are a number of moments in this that sort of showcase the way that society changed in the wake of World War One ending um, through different characters and their experiences. You get to look at it through different facets. And, um, you know, what is it like for women? Some women in this are um, in many ways more empowered because they're able to seek work and that kind of thing. In some ways, they're still trapped in constraints. Um, Francis takes on a lot of housework that she'd never had to deal with before, um, which is a form of work, but is like unpaid labour. Um, so that's where they have to find other ways of creating money. Like all of that was really interesting. Um, I struggled with this, I think, because... No, I, I don't think. I know I struggled with it. Uh, what this is, is the first 300 pages of this 
so the first half is very much focused on that aspect of it. We focus on Frances. It's a Sarah Waters. She's obviously going to have a relationship with a woman in this. And it's very slow paced and very much like a character focused. Um, And I think that because I had read the back and I knew that this was described as a crime novel, while I enjoyed that first 300 pages, I I posted a Goodreads update on page 300 where I was like when is the crime gonna happen so I think because of my knowledge of Sarah Waters like it's not that I don't think that all of those aspects were done in an interesting way but I was just sat there and I was like when is any plot gonna take place and it does take place it's just I also struggled (laughs) with the latter 300 pages because there is a crime we're dealing with repercussions of crime and there's a very lengthy court case in this which I can see is Sarah Waters showing a very detailed understanding of what court cases were like in this particular time period. And I can see that she's obviously done a lot of research and all of that historic detail, I'm sure, is really accurate. Boy, is it slow. (laughs) And I think one of the reasons why I potentially struggled with this more than I would have if I had just picked this up and gone in is because... The other Sarah Waters that I've read is Fingersmith. And Fingersmith was like dazzlingly good. There are twists and turns and it really kept me on my toes. And I loved it. And in comparison to this, there aren't really twists and turns. It was to me, the crime itself was a very straightforward crime. And the solution was a very straightforward solution. There were some moments of tension, which I did enjoy in the latter half. And there was a, t- a, p- a moment where it seemed like we might be about to do something a little interesting and there might be a twist. And then I didn't really feel like we really committed to the twist. And then it was like, oh, no, no, that's that's not actually the case. And I was like, OK, so the interesting bit, not real. <laughs> so I have another Sarah Waters because I bought it before I read this, which I'm saving for next year's dewey uh, because I do think I need a small break. So I'm not giving up on Sarah Waters at all. For me, this had interesting elements, is far longer than it needed to be. This did not need to be 600 pages to tell this story. I'm sorry. Um, Sarah Waters can write. Absolutely she can write. And I will read more Sarah Waters in the future. But this was a disappointment. And I think I rated it like two stars. So there we go. (laughs) Back to some non-fiction. I also read Takeaway Stories from a Childhood Behind the Counter by Angela Hugh which is uh, a memoir about Angela's life growing up um, in the Welsh Valleys, her family owned Chinese takeaway. And this is just sort of like reflecting on her childhood and growing up there. It's a really interesting perspective. I've never read anything from like this perspective before. And I found it like I learned so many things. I learned like there was a reason that there was like only one Chinese takeaway in their village is because she had other family that lived in Wales. But obviously, you don't want to compete against each other. Like you have your area that you need to be loyal to you. You don't want to have another family member's Chinese takeaway also there to compete against. Um, I found moments of this like I really really loved like when she was talking about how the the sort of counter was this like liminal in between space for her like she spent a lot of her childhood working because her family are trying to survive and make enough money to live and provide for them so like everyone has to pitch in and whereas her friends had time off like for her like the weekends and the evenings are the busy time so she is helping Um, But she talks about sort of like existing in this liminal space that is the counter where it's like she is ready if anyone does order. She's ready to help in the back if she needs to. She's kind of also doing things like schoolwork and that kind of thing. And um, just there was this passage really early on where she just discussed like existing in that area. And I found that really interesting. Um, It was also really interesting to learn more about, um, for example, her family had to go back to Hong Kong a certain amount of time so that she doesn't lose her citizen status there, because then if she loses it, then it's much harder to go back because you can only stay for certain amounts of time. So she had these really long summers that they would spend in Hong Kong with family, and then it would be back to Wales, back to work and all of that. Um, I would definitely say there is, uh, as this develops, 
and she's looking at her family's relationship like there is an element there that is uh to do with her father and anger issues and violence and that kind of thing so just a word of warning if that's stuff that for example you find difficult to read about that might be triggering like that's not something that you would necessarily know would be in this so just a hint i would be really interested in the audiobook of this actually because i think it is read by the author and I would be really interested to hear her reading it. I liked it. I think at times it could have done with like a small edit. There were a few moments where I did feel like we were sort of repeating a little bit. And I just wonder a little bit if that is just an element of writing a memoir when you're still processing things, maybe. Um, is that, you know, this is all like recent lived experience that you're then translating. And maybe with a little bit of distance, some of those repetitions might have been like excised to make a slightly tighter novel but I did enjoy it and it was a, a perspective that I really liked and there are recipes at the end of every chapter and I love me a food memoir that includes recipes um Chinese food I have many food allergies including soy <laughs> so Chinese food is something that I've given up in the last year since I got diagnosed but a uh, fun fact if you also have a soy allergy coconut aminos are a really good sub for soy sauce so I was looking at some of these recipes and I was like maybe this is my opportunity start delving back in but just make it myself. We'll see. But um, our, an enjoyable nonfiction to another nonfiction. I also read The Welsh Language in Cardiff, A History of Survival by Owen John Thomas. This was super fascinating. This is one that I would say, um, if you are new to reading about Welsh history and the history of Welsh language, this is not where I would suggest starting. Where I would suggest starting is it's in this bookcase somewhere, it's called The History of the Welsh Language. I can't remember the author, but I'll write it in the description down below, because that gives like an overview of like the history of the Welsh language across many hundreds of years, coming up to more contemporary, like um, the work that has been done to preserve the Welsh language and that kind of thing. So if you are interested in the history, definitely start there. But if you are already reading about the history of the Welsh language, this is a really interesting next space to go because this is focused on Cardiff and it's sort of challenging that myth and that idea that is perpetuated a lot that's like, well, Cardiff has never been Welsh speaking. And um, actually, I think you'll find <laughs> it has been. So we're going through one thing that this did really well is uh, it gives you like a lot of the core like data to back up this uh this idea that actually cardiff has been welsh speaking for a long time and that amount of welsh speaking has fluctuated absolutely but that doesn't mean that it was never there one chapter that i really enjoyed was looking at slander cases because um it's in in even during times when court proceedings had to be written in english slander cases were the exception because like this one guy they wrote down the slander that he had supposedly said in english and then he was like sauce guys i don't speak english so i definitely couldn't have said this because i don't speak that language and then they were like oh, okay we will record these in welsh from now on which means you have a treasure trove that was so fun to read like some of the insults were just top-notch excellent but is also a really fascinating insight into like your actual normal people who are existing you know there's this idea that like a lot of the time the dominant historic narratives we get are the ones that are from people in power because they have the ability to write and preserve their accounts and it's like when you look at a lot of the data that is stuff from here you get like a real your normal person's lived experience of interaction with language like he looks at place names he looks at family names he looks at all of these um varying points of data and tracks things through history so definitely one that I'm like read if you're already on that journey I wouldn't necessarily suggest starting here because it is like stat and fact heavy but it was super interesting and I learned a lot of rude words that I didn't know before to go back to some fiction, I did my classic Jasper Ford read for Deweython and I read The Air Affair. This is a reread for me. And I realised as I was reading it, I was like, wow, the plot I remember of this is literally the last hundred pages of the book. And there were like 200 pages beforehand that I had 100% forgotten. And I'm so pleased I reread because I really enjoyed it. I think I probably enjoyed it more this time around because I have a much deeper appreciation for how Jasper Ford does world building. Um, so this is set, this is 
the first of the Thursday Next books. And Thursday Next is a detective that we are following in this world that is um, alternate history kind of. And uh, literature and books have this massive prevailing influence on the world. As with all Jasper Ford, there is a silliness here. There is a humour here. But also, I love his world building. He does alternate history so interestingly. One of the massive defining world building aspects of this is that there is a uh, conflict in Crimea between uh, England and Russia, which feels more pertinent than it did when I read this the first time around. I also loved to tap into our Dewey thought angle of representation of Wales. Jasper Ford and his alternate history always has little Welsh details that I really like. In this, it's that there's a Socialist Republic of Wales that is ruled by their president, which is Owen Glyndwr. And all of that was really fab. I really enjoyed that aspect. I love how he creates these alternate history sort of worlds which are like the backdrop to the society absolutely but also like we're looking at war like Thursday is a veteran of this conflict she has wounds from it we're looking at um there are parallels you can draw with contemporary political events stuff like that but that's all the background to like what is actually like Thursday X is investigating this guy who is like the third most evil man in the world or something he's ranked and so she's being involved in this investigation as part of that we end up with a situation whereby um manuscripts are being taken the original manuscripts because this person has this ability to go into them and take things out of them and if you do that with the original manuscript you affect all copies so there is some stuff to do with Jane Eyre um I just had a really rollicksome time with this I really like Jasper Ford I definitely would say that um, this reading of Jane Eyre is way more like straightforward romance than I personally like to approach Jane Eyre. I like to approach Jane Eyre with a little bit more nuance because I think Rochester ain't shit. But that's just me. <laughs> um, suffice to say, I will definitely be continuing with the Thursday Next series. I had the best time. A another piece of nonfiction, I was very nonfiction heavy this month is um, Half Time by Nigel Owens. Nigel Owens is a very famous Welsh uh, rugby. Oh god, I've literally just blanked on the word. The man. Referee! <laughs> I don't know why that vanished. Um, this is the first of his autobiographies. I believe he has at least one more now. This was written about 10 years ago now, about 2013 I think, which was interesting because I know what his life is like now, but why I became interested in this like literally years ago now is because I was interested because Nigel Owens is openly gay in this sort of like rugby world. And I previously read Gareth Thomas's autobiography who he was the first out gay rugby player in I think the English league at the time he was playing in, although he himself is Welsh. And Nigel Owens I believe was the first out uh, rugby referee. And um, this is another one where I would say that I would recommend this if you are actively a fan of Nigel or are super interested in like Welsh rugby from a refereeing perspective. If you don't already know him, I would question like how much you'd get out of this because you are very much like... Uh, it's not one. It's one that's very much told in like a very straightforward, matter of fact way, which I feel is just like reminiscent of how Nigel speaks. Like I could hear his voice saying it as it went. So it's not one that, again, it's not one that's like beautifully written piece of art memoir. It's like this man telling you about his life and growing up and all of that, which was interesting from my perspective. I learned a lot about refereeing. Um, I also learned a lot about like just his he's growing up his route like he is now retired from uh professional refereeing internationally i think as well as locally that could be wrong um but i do know that now he has a farm with his partner and so his solid farming background i made a lot of sense as i was reading it also it was really nice to read this knowing that he now has a long-term partner because he talks at times about how lonely he felt and how isolated he felt and that did culminate in an attempted suicide attempt so just like a little trigger warning for that but as well as that even after he came out and he he gained a lot from coming out there was you know a lot of positive effect on his life he still talks about at this point that he was writing it 10 years ago not really expecting to find a long-term partner and just sort of accepting that he is going to be alone and that sometimes he feels lonely and and sometimes he feels sad that he won't have like a family and that kind of thing. Knowing that he now has a long term supportive partner and sort of has built a family and a farm with this man made me really happy. <laughs> Um, on to my two DNFs, and then I'll talk about the extra books I managed to squeeze in. So, 
I did pick up The Matter of Wales by Jan Morris and I DNF'd it. Sometimes I find Jan Morris's writing to be lovely, particularly her travel writing when she paints pictures of place. I feel like she can do it really atmospherically and evocatively. This one, to be honest with you, felt a bit dry. I've read quite a few books by now about like Welsh history, Welsh independence, that kind of thing. And I was just like, you know what? I don't need this one. I don't need to read this one. So I, I let that one go. And then also Mavon and the Guardians of Celtic Britain, Hero Myths in the Mavonogion by Caitlin Matthews. I also DNF this one because uh, I always interested in reading more about the Mavonogion. Yes, please. I personally think that this is an angle that I'm not interested in. So this is coming from like a very like neo-druidic kind of angle on the Mavonogion. It's talking a lot about like viewing the text through archetypes and that sort of like almost Jungian sort of psychon psychos can't say that word apparently Jungian psychoanalysis where you create archetypes and then you project them onto a text and that kind of thing and that's to be honest with you it's just not a perspective on the Mavonogion that I'm overly interested in I read a few reviews that are calling some of her readings into like historical accuracy like is that really historically accurate so I just when I have so many other books including these two that I managed to squeeze in, I just thought, no, I'm not going to bother. So the extra books I managed to do are um, the works of Greville Mechain, edited and translated by Katie Gramich. This was fabulous. I've been wanting to read Greville Mechain's poetry for ages. One of the history of the Welsh language, maybe the history of the Welsh language, maybe the history of Wales, can't remember. I read a book which talked about her poetry and I was super interested. She's really famous for being like that medieval Welsh poetess who wrote a poem about her vagina. Whereas I think that is a mildly reductionist view on her and actually that she's a really interesting writer. So this particular um, translation was fab because what it does is um, it gives you his poem. Uh, this is the original Welsh. This is the direct literal translation of what it means. And this is the actual like poetic translation that Katie Gramwick has done. And that was really fab because I'm still on a Welsh learning journey. So being able to read it in the original Welsh, know specifically what the actual words meant and then read the poetic version of it. Super interesting for me personally, had a fabulous time. When it comes to topics and themes, I also really enjoyed learning them and getting to grips with them so there's two opening poems in this are like her explicitly religious poems one of which was very popular at the time it was written um because we have a number of manuscript uh remnants of it the other one much less popular and then you go into her poetry that is more like erotic and bawdy and about like women's experience but I loved it because it's so interesting to have a medieval woman poet writing about like her body and her there's 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 different ones there's one that's like um to a jealous husband oh yeah there's one that's to jealous wives um there's another one that is about like a husband beating his wife and stuff like this and um there are also ones that are written in response to male poets of the time. One of them is like taking this man to task because he wrote a poem disparaging all of womanhood. And she's like, you've only picked terrible examples. Here are loads of examples of really famous, faithful women. Get your head out of your ass, mate. And I loved that. And then after the first section is poems that we know are by her. The second section is poems that are attributed to her, but there's a little bit of questioning about that. And then the final section is poems from other people that put her in context. For example, everyone's always like, oh, she's writing poetry about her body. And there's like literally an example of a man doing exactly the same equivalent. But we don't call that man like the penis poet, do we? No, we don't. So loved this. Found it super duper interesting and an illuminating experience for sure. The final book I managed to squeeze in for Dirithon is The History of the Kings of Britain by Geoffrey of Monmouth. Who is this? Oh, and translated and with an introduction by Lewis Thorpe. I have always meant to read this from an Arthurian standpoint. It does cover more than just Arthur. It is sort of looking at this this mythologicized version of the founding of Britain and that Britain has this uh, Trojan root and all of that kind of stuff. What 
is interesting that Geoffrey of Monmouth is doing is that he does interweave real historical people. It's just he creates this vision of history that is like wildly inaccurate, but is like a big propaganda thing. And that's really interesting to see like what ideas are being promoted about the founding of Britain and how do they relate to the particular time that this was written in. For example, he's super disparaging of the Romans. They, yeah, he creates this moment that like Caesar sends a letter to Britain or something. No, Caesar is like, yeah, sends a letter to Britain and is like, you guys better pay homage to me. And he gets back this letter that's like, we both spring from Trojan roots. You are no better than us. And all, and then like, I don't know, this big conflict where the Romans are like rubbish and useless, but obviously actually do have to succeed somehow because that's what actually happened in history. So like, at times, was it a little bit dull? Occasionally, yes. At other times, I was like, what is happening? This vision of history is wild to me. So, like, not like a new favourite, but one of those ones that I'm like, I'm really glad I read it. It was a very interesting sort of, like, historic view. It does, as it goes on, um, tap into Arthurian myth with um, Merlin and, like, the... I don't know if you know that myth about how, like, a lot of people attribute the dragon on the Welsh flag to being because of Merlin's vision of, like, these two dragons fighting underneath. Although, spoiler alert, it actually comes from a Roman root. Um... And if you want to learn more about that, there's a little book I can recommend that's like the history of the Welsh dragon. I'll put that in the description down below as well. But suffice it to say, this was um, an interesting, like, historic read. It's not like one that I'll reread necessarily for fun, but I'm glad to have actually read it. Those are all the books that I read for Dirithon. I would love to hear your thoughts if you have also read any of these. I would also love any recommendations you have. Thank you to the people who gave me recommendations on my TBR video. I have noted them all down and when the time comes next year I will have hopefully picked some of them up so that I can build my TBR again. I always enjoy taking part in Dirithon. I would like to just give an end of video shout out to people who I also enjoy. Um, there will be some links in the description down below for like other people's Dirithon content that you can consume if you are really interested in that and don't know where to go um otherwise i hope your march was lovely there will be a part two reading wrap up that is all the stuff that i read in march that's not for doing because i did sneak some others in so keep your eyes peeled for that but i hope you have a really lovely day i will speak to you next time for that other wrap-up video <laughs>